Welcome to uh, my talk on the Trusted Computing Platform Alliance, the motherboard of all big brothers. Um, I'm Lucky Green. Some of you may have seen some, give me some talks here before in years past. Uh, this one will be a somewhat unusual talk. Um, the reason why it will be unusual is because you will hear a tale of, um, of epic proportions. You will hear cons about conspiracies and deceit. You will hear details about uh, conspiracies that um, some certainly would say are conspiracies that have been going on in some cases for as much as seven years. Um, I'm quite glad that um, I've been scheduled after this very interesting talk by a scholar of attorneys which had certainly uh, addressed some of the details of the DMCA. Um, because this talk too will, by necessity, even though it's mostly a technical talk, have to address some of the issues that DMCA is raising probably to most of us that are interested in how our equipment works. Um, the, some of you may have heard since of Microsoft's Palladium initiative, which is very much related to the initiatives of the Trusted Computing Platform Alliance. Um, I, I won't talk about Palladium specifically, um, except that Palladium is really a is, is really a, a sub-section of the TCPA with some slight modifications. The Palladium effort grew out of the TCPA effort. Microsoft has made some minor changes to the underlying architecture, but many of the components and most importantly, all the conclusions remain intact. Um, so, first of all, what is the TCPA and what are its business objectives? The TCPA's business objective, the objectives are fairly straightforward. Its members wish to prevent the use of unlicensed software, such as, say, copies of Microsoft Word. Licensing fee or that could be copies of an operating system, but na na naturally it also will be uh, copies of digital content. A key component of TCPA is to mandate and make stick. From a technical perspective, not just from the legal perspective that the, that the DMCA allows you to make um, copy protection stick, from a technical perspective, make it stick that you will not be able to rip CDs, you will not be able to create DivXs, um, it will plug the analog hole, and I will later get into what the analog hole is all about and why Senator Hollings is very much interested in the analog hole. Um, it will, which is probably the most insidious aspect of the TCPA, enable a truly Orwellian information flow control scheme that is so far unthinkable because the technology is, until the TCPA simply hasn't existed. Um, lastly, perhaps not lastly, uh, an additional objective of the TCPA is to grow the market for the PCs. Here's why. One of the TCPA's founding members is Intel Corporation. Intel, as most of you know, makes most, a, a fair chunk of its money from PC microprocessors. Intel owns most of the market of the PC microprocessor. Really, AMD is only left as a, as a competitor, and they're not a very big one from Intel's perspective. So how does Intel grow the company? Uh, as far as Intel is concerned, the way to grow the company is by growing the market for PCs. One market niche that has been identified are home entertainment center PCs, such as many folks already have set up their own video servers and MP3 servers at home. It's quite clear that there's a consumer market for such a product. Intel intends to be providing the chips. Um, and then uh, an issue that, of course, can never be forgotten Whenever you see these large industry initiatives, they cannot be pulled off without government cooperation, or perhaps one should say government collusion. The government, too, has some objectives. They wish to see their operational needs met. Um, that could be the FBI, that could be the Office of Homeland Security, the NSA, and let's not forget about non-US law enforcement agencies, which have needs of their own that are perhaps somewhat different from, from the needs of those in the US. How does TCP accomplish these business objectives? It does so, to sum it up in one sentence, by preventing the owner of a computer from obtaining root access. That is you. By taking away root from the owner and giving root to third parties, such as those mentioned on the previous slide, um, and making it stick from a technical perspective, 
the members of the TCPA believe that they can finally do away with all these pesky cracks and hacks and serial numbers and binary patches to uh, MSO.DLL that uh, will make the registration codes go away and all these other things that they feel are costing them money. How is this accomplished? It's accomplished by adding a whole new mode to uh, either the chipset or the CPU. There will be three levels of access. Privileged access, which is available to TCPA members only um, and their clientele. Underprivileged access, which will uh, be available to you. And unprivileged access, which you will, which will be available to TCPA uh, to non-TCPA applications. Basically, general code that you simply don't trust. Where is all of this coming from? The Trusted Computing Platform Alliance has a somewhat interesting history. It grew out of a number of efforts, certainly Process ID at Intel, big failure, big public failure in 1998, but just because, because Intel was crucified by the press, and at the time by its competitor AMD, does not mean that the ideas have gone away. It simply means that the ideas have somewhat changed and the implementation cycles have lengthened. Uh, the implementation is still very much on track. Um, the concept of encrypted CPU instruction sets. I first heard about encrypted CPU instruction sets coming out of Intel, I think it was in 1995. Um, at the time, Intel fully intended to roll out encrypted CPU instruction sets as the second phase after the processor ID. When the processor ID went down in flames, Intel decided that perhaps now might not be such a good idea to roll out encrypted instruction sets. Uh, or suffer the same fate. So encrypted instruction sets again have been put on the back burner. They have not gone away. Um, the International Cryptography Framework by HP, few people remember it. It was a fairly big initiative. And then of course smart cards on the motherboard which, is, which IBM is working on and a few other initiatives that I don't really want to get into at this point. Who is the TP TCPA? The TCPA was founded in 1996 by Intel, Microsoft, HP, Compaq, and IBM. Um, there are many DRM initiatives out there. Some of them are, uh, have been founded by the content owners. This is a different initiative. Um, Intel, obviously, Microsoft is the largest operating system and application vendor on the, on the planet. Um, HP, Compaq, and IBM, between them, own a fair share of certainly the, the, the business side of the platform market. And Intel, of course, provides the CPUs to the vast majority of these PCs. Um, so really the TCPA is a form of platform product vendors. Who has since the initial founding members joined the TCPA actively? On the CPU side, we have Intel, Advanced Micro Devices and Motorola. Hands up here who has, who's for their daily primary computer is using a PC that is not using a CPU by one of these three operating system vendors. One, two, three, four, okay, we have a few, not very many. Um, the BIOS and chipset vendors, or as I say, the BIOS vendors and some specialized chip vendors, Phoenix slash Award, they have merged, um, AMI, uh, National Semiconductor, which again, amongst them, accounts to the overwhelming majority of the BIOS market. On the security side, perennial favorites, VeriSign, Wave Systems, RSA Security, Checkpoint, Certicom, Trent Micro, Semantic, Tripwire, and uh, the Swiss Crypto AG, which is probably best known for the fact that they actually put our NSA traps into their equipment uh, for many years. One of their sales folks was arrested by the Iranian government, um, uh, must have been at least 10 years ago, for, for selling them, the Iranian government NSA spiked equipment. Um, Crypto AG immediately fired the poor guy who was rotting in an Iranian jail, um, even though he was their best selling salesman of the company, had been so for many years. Um, not really, as I said, it's essentially the European vendor branch of the NSA. On the application side, we have Microsoft, little surprise there. And Adobe, very little surprise there. The scatter of case that you heard about just in the presentation earlier, of course, was all about Adobe. Adobe called the FBI to asked the FBI to please pick up Scalarov on criminal charges. Adobe later, later on distanced themselves from, from the activities, but the bottom line is it was Adobe who got it all started. System side, again, you have, you've seen these names, HP, IBM, Dell, Gateway, Fujitsu, Samsung, Toshiba. 
Um, all the major platform vendors, all the major um, laptop vendors, except Sony, which is a different story, I'll, I'll address it later. All in all, the TCP has 170 member companies. It, I know the font's too small to read. Suffice to say, it's the who's who of um, the platform market. All right, how does TCP work? Let's talk about the technology. There are two phases of, let's talk about phase one. In phase one, of the TCPA, a trusted platform module, or TPM, which Ross Anderson in his FAQ about the TCPA um, lovingly calls, calls the Fritz chip, after Senator Fritz Hollings, who has um, currently a bill pending in, uh, in Congress, that, will, that I'll talk about in more detail later. What's the Fritz chip? The Fritz chip is a tamper-resistant chip that will be included on all future motherboards. Um, a little while from now, as to how long is, is unclear, you should see the first such motherboards probably showing up on the store shelves, according to an analyst at Gartner Group that I've discussed this with, about in the first or second quarter of next year. Um, at that time, not all new motherboards will have the chips, but the first motherboards with these chips will start shipping about Q1, Q2, 2003. That's according to the Gartner Group. Uh, the chip will be surface mount. Um, it can either be a separate part on the motherboard or it might be integrated with the existing chipset on the motherboard. It really is, is up to the chipset manufacturers and the motherboard manufacturers. Um, the chip will be a common criteria EL evaluated to EL level 3 augmented, which is really the most, the, the best, the highest security evaluation level you can do for a part at the cost constraints that the manufacturers were under. You can do certainly better. You can get um, a device, say one of the boxes from Encypher, et cetera, but now we're talking of thousands of dollars. You can't add thousands of dollars to the cost of a motherboard or you will no longer sell any. The cost of the part realistically has to be down somewhere in the dollar range. What does the TPM do? It has two major areas of functionality. One is measurement, which um, I like to think of as snooping. And the other one is reporting, which is probably best thought of as snitching. <laughs> Let's look at the measurement side. On the measurement side, you have the components that you would expect. You have um, an engine that supports basic cryptographic operations. You have a secure cryptographic key store. Um, and as I'm speaking here about, I'm using terms such as trusted and secure. Um, they're used in this presentation and by the TCP and its members somewhat differently than most of you probably would and most of its customers would. The trusted here means trusted by Microsoft to prevent you from copying their software and trusted by Disney to prevent you from watching their movies without giving them a dollar. Um, secure here means inevitably secure from the owner that is secure from you. Um, this secure key store allows um, the applications that make use of the TPM to securely store, store keys that the user and the applications will not simply be able to read out. There is the ex expected key management primitives and um, there is something that I call the boot process hashing because one of the measurements that the, TCP, that the TPM engages in is, is, a measure, is measuring all the um, components of the PC boot process. I will show you later as to how this works and what these components are. Um, let's look at the cryptographic operations. What would you expect? Uh, there is a built-in built -in support for hashing, SHA-1 and HMAC. There is a, a random number generator built into the, TC, uh, into the TPM. Yet again, much to my dismay, uh, just as we saw with the random number generator by Intel, we are only given access to the post-widening output. The cryptographers amongst you will know that what this means is that you have absolutely no assurance that this that this random number generator is actually good, um, or or in fact is fully deterministic with just a 20 bit bit seed. You simply have no knowledge and no way of determining the quality of these random numbers. Um, this is not. Accidental, the TCPA common criteria evaluation specifications mandate that the user not be given access to the raw bits or anything pre-widening. Why? I leave it to your imagination. The bottom line is that you will not, neither you nor anybody else will be able to determine whether this random number generator actually is, has random numbers or is spitting out predictable values. 
Um, you have your expected asymmetric key generation. It's 2048-bit RS, um, RSA, which is actually one of the few changes that the design has seen in the last few years. It initially was specified at 1024-bit, uh, but uh, Microsoft and Disney apparently felt it, and Intel felt it insufficient um, to protect uh, their next copies of Snow White, so they moved up to 2048-bit. Um, you have the expected asymmetric key encrypt-decrypt um, and symmetric encrypt-decrypt. Um, initially, the specs called for triple dose because AES had not yet been specified, but with AES, AES specified, probably what you will see is, is the use of AES. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a tamper-resistant hash and key store. All right, let's look at the key management. Am I going too fast? Can you guys hear me? All right. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of ground to cover, and we only have an hour. Actually, we only have 45 minutes, so I'm trying to rush through this, through this talk a bit. But it's, there's a lot of information. They've been working on this for a long time, and they thought about it very hard. Um, you may wonder, how do I actually know about this? Um, I initially found out about it uh, quite a few years ago, but I must confess in public that I spent an entire year sitting on a TCPA working group. Um, I sat in the working group because um, at the time, I believed that this might be a marvelous technology to secure what's sitting underneath my operating system. I don't trust the hardware that my, that my OS is running on. And I thought that you know, TCP was the way to give me the assurance that I, that I can trust my hardware. I ultimately realized it was unable to do that, and moreover, it was able to do other things that I by no means wanted to see done. Learn a few things. Um, and just for the record, all this information is public information. I'm not violating any NDAs. The TPM is at the factory equipped with a TPM unique, which means motherboard unique, endorsement key. This is an RSA key that's signed by the TPM manufacturer's key, which in turn is signed by um, the TCPA master key. It, it's a key hierarchy that goes back to the TCPA master key. We do not know, I do not know, nobody that I know that's able to talk about it knows who holds this TCPA master key. It would be a marvelous um, topic to determine. Um, this key is used to determine that the TPM is genuine, and it's not just something that pretends to be a TPM and then later on will leak all the keys and therefore allow you to uh, not pay for Microsoft Word. Once you, the user takes possession of the TPM, the user then uses, um, the user then generates key pairs, multiple key pairs if they wish, sub submits those to a CA for certification, and um, signs the TPM signs this certificate request with the, TC with the TPM uh, endorsement key, thus proving to, proving to the CA that the, that the keys were generated by a real TPM and that the user, in fact, does not have access to the private keys. Let's look at the hashing. I, I don't know how well you can see this, uh, this graph, but I'll try to run you through it. Um, let's take a look at a trusted computing platform pre-operating uh, pre system boot process. This is really just the standard PC platform boot process um, with some enhancements. In the top left, we have the root of trust. You have to start trusting somewhere from something. That's called the root of trust. In the TCPA's case, you have to trust the BIOS boot block. The BIOS boot block, if the BIOS boot, boot block is compromised, all bets are off. Um, however, it's, it's, if there are various reasons why it's hard to replace the BIOS boot block in this case. The BIOS boot block um, loads the BIOS. Um, the BIOS, after the BIOS, you have the various option ROMs load from, for example, your Ethernet cards, your SCSI cards, whatever option ROMs might be loaded after the BIOS is loaded. Um, if you, if you look at the right side, you see in the, the gray area that's the TPM and its, it's, a, its associated storage area, which, by the way, is unlimited. The TPM, um, very similar to what Encypher is doing with the key blobs, the TPM simply, A, as a triple does, encrypts the data and then stores it as, a, stores it as an opaque file on disk. Thus, the potential protected storage area behind a TPM is as big as your hard drive. Uh, TPM stores the hash. Option ROMs are being hashed. The hash is loaded, option rooms are loaded. Then you load the uh, digital rights management, digital rights management bootloader. The hash of that is stored, which finally loads the, the digital rights management kernel. The digital rights, man rights management kernel is what Microsoft in the Palladium initiative calls the nub. I don't know why they call it the nub. Or trusted operating route. 
the trusted operating route is, is essentially, it's very similar to a microkernel that gets loaded before your existing kernel, be it Linux or or NT, your existing ring, ring zero supervisor, before your existing ring zero supervisor mode code ever gets loaded, you're already running on top of a, of, of a DRM microkernel. Um, after the DRM microkernel loads, it loads the operating system. The, um, the TPM again throws the hash. Um, it, it may, there may be a, an additional step. When I'm speaking here of an operating system load, this is a generic operating system. These are operating systems. This is what TCP allows an operating system vendor to implement. Not all operating system vendors will implement all features. This is the sum total of the features that you can put in. Um, what you frequently will find, will find is that the, either the entire operating system or critical parts of the operating system will be, will be encrypted on disk. So what happens is the TPM loads the, loads the, loads the machine-specific decryption key of the operating system binary, decrypts the operating system encrypted on the drive so you don't actually know what the operating system does anymore because it's AES encrypted so there's no more reverse engineering or patching an operating system without permission. Um, what uh, the operating system gets decrypted and in, in the uh, the OS binary gets decrypted, loaded, loaded, and loaded as usual. Um, in in phase one, the decryption of the symmetric decryption is actually taking place outside the TPM. So the TPM decrypts uh, the DPA TPM provides an internal uh, RSA key which which decrypts the um, OS. Um, AES key, but that's all. That's not initially done in hardware because it was too expensive, which of course means that there's an avenue for attack in future versions of the, of, of the TCP and of course in the, in the proposed Microsoft Palladium. Uh, this would actually be done at the CPU level, thus requiring you to to go through some fairly invasive measures to actually get the clear text. Um, the operating system gets loaded, and initially the operating system will load a approved hardware list, which I will just call here an HCL, and the initial serial number revocation list, an SRL. You may wonder what the heck is a serial number revocation list. I've never heard of that. We'll get to that. Um, the, the TCP, the Trusted Computing Platform Operating System, is are you getting scared yet? Yeah, you should. Um, the Trusted Computing Platform Operating System is now in a known initial state. What do we know? We know the BIOS is TCP approved, uh, as, as far as these approvals are concerned. If you think you can get an approval for your distribution of Linux, your home distribution, then you're out of your mind. Um, the, um, the BIOS um, is TCP approved and signed. The PCI cards are TCP approved and signed, or at least their, um, their expansion ROMs are. Um, of course, who would get signatures for the devices? Well, certainly nobody who cannot certify that the DMA channels used by the devices do not enable unapproved access to operating RAM, because with DMA, of course, you can just go straight to the operating RAM without ever going to the CPU and its, and its DRM microkernel. Hence, you need to know that the, that the hardware is not instrumented to allow you to do that. Hence, no assurance that you don't use DRM to get at Snow White, um, no signature for you. Um, you also will know that no kernel level debugger is loaded because the operating system binary is hashed. You have a hash of all the modules. You know for a fact that there is no way for the user to get at the raw bits. Um, you have an initial list of undesirable applications that um, you are not allowed to run. That's our uh, serial number revocation list. And let's give some examples of TCP or TCP-like operating systems. This is, of course, Microsoft's Palladium. Take a look at the DRM or its pattern that will go into some more details as to how, what this is all about. Um, and uh, HP, and what didn't make it on the slide, both HP and IBM are coming out or planning to come out and are actively working on TCP-evaluated versions of Linux that actually will have been subjected to security evaluation. Um, again, I will talk about these a little bit more later. What does, the, what does the Trusted Computing Platform Operating System initially do? It first starts a secure time counter. There will be no turning back the system clock. Why is that important? Well, if you say rent a video for a week, we certainly wouldn't want you to watch this after 10 days. Or if your Microsoft Word license it will be for the period of a year, then you certainly should not be able to run it after a year and a half. Um, the operating system then synchronizes against an NTP server um, and um, finally goes to the, goes to the uh, over the internet, obtains a new hardware um, 
um, and a hot new hardware control list and a new serial number of location list. This doesn't have to happen every time the OS boots up. The, the, there, there will be metrics that will allow you to, to work in an offline mode. You don't have to always be connected. But say if you don't connect for a week, your DVD may no longer play, and if you don't connect for a month, then perhaps your word processor will no, no longer work. The exact times are TBD. Um, now, in the pre-application load, there will be two primary, two primary application loader protection modes. The first one is mandatory. Uh, in a mandatory mode, the operating system will simply flat out refuse to load any non-TCP approved applications or applications that are on the serial number of location list or just otherwise deemed um, undesirable. There will also be a voluntary mode uh, in which the operating system will load a non-approved application, sending a signal to all running applications that the system has been compromised by its owner and to please clean up after itself. Um, as a result, and I have actually have a little graph here, a uh, little table how this works. Um, if if you're running in voluntary mode, you can you can lo you can load an unapproved application, but all your applications that are expecting the DRM microkernel to to guard them against the user will then simply shut down, zeroize out their memory, and ask the operating system to clean up after themselves before your application ever gets I/O on the memory. Um, what will the application do after it's been loaded? Um, well, the application, of course, verifies the hashes in the, that are stored in the TPM that we stored earlier. Um, it verifies that it, in fact, is licensed for the for the particular platform. As I mentioned earlier, um, each um, each platform owner will have keys that are specific to the platform, so you will know for a fact that this copy of Office is licensed to this particular motherboard and no other motherboard. Um, it will verify the license duration, say if you have a license that's time limited, which under that scheme most licenses probably will be, because you can now actually finally make time limited license stick. Um, it will obtain a fresh serial number of location list from the net. It will verify that mandatory applications are running. One, one example is there are a number of application vendors out there that are nowadays um, subsidizing the application by means of Spyro, be that Gator or whatever. There's a bunch of them out there. You folks have seen them. Um, but what they found is that there are users out there that will just simply uninstall the Spyro um, that's running on their PCs when um, and thus getting the benefits of the free software without the drawbacks of the Spyro. Under the scheme, you can guarantee that an application that you deem necessary for the application to run such as Spyro is in fact loaded, operation, operating, and uh, unpatched or otherwise disabled. Um, then the application in some cases will obtain a, a fresh document revocation list from a number of document revocation servers. Um, I will explain to you what document revocation servers are again on a later slide. Only at this point the application will actually accept user input or do anything with your documents. Why? What, what, what can, why are the application vendors so keen on it? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's a revenue enhancement, enhancement issue. There is a, uh, you, it allows, it at least the belief that it allows them to grow the market. Here we have some good quotes. Bill, Bill Gates says, we came thinking of this about music, but then, as in digital rights management for music, but then we realized that email and documents were far more interesting domains. Why are email and documents far more interesting domains? And Stephen Levy wrote in the article that, ex that in the expose in about Microsoft's Palladium um, on Microsoft NBC, he wrote, uh, you could create Word documents that could be read only in the next week. So, we get to the first quiz. How will the law help the TCPA and its members stifle competition? Here's why. Um, the application vendors, such as Microsoft, and Bill Gates said so as much in the interview, intend on wrapping all their file formats in digital rights management. Those of you who were here for the previous talk will know the answer. So what's the question here? The question is, what does a federal prosecutor call an application that is compatible with a proprietary DRM wrap file format? Any takers? A circumvention device, exactly. It's an illegal infringement device. That, that's correct. An illegal infringement device. 
What does it mean if your if your compatible application is an illegal infringement device? It means that the software author who wrote this application is subject to five hundred thousand dollars fine and five years in prison. Double that for each subsequent offense um, for writing a compatible application. That doesn't even require any new laws. That law is already in the book. It's called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So, that leaves software authors with two very simple choices. The moment file formats are wrapped in DRM, you have two choices. You cannot create interoperable software or you can sp uh, spend five years in prison. That's assuming that you only have one user. If you have more users, that adds another 10 for each additional user. It's, which is not to say that they'll put you away for 100 years, which they could but probably wouldn't, they will simply come to you and say, well, we can put you away, we, we might, there's about an 80% chance that we can put you away for a very, very long time. Are you willing to take the chance or will you just simply plead guilty and take the five, six, ten years that we're offering you? Your attorney will probably tell you, and I'm not an attorney, but I hope there may, maybe there are some attorneys in the courtroom, in the courtroom, uh, in, 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 the, in the courtroom. Uh, but your attorney will, I believe, in all likelihood tell you that you're better off to take the deal. And you probably will feel the same way. We talked about measurement. Let's talk about reporting. So we, we have we, we have the snooping. Let's get onto the snitching. Um, TPM reporting is about reporting state to challenges. Challenges can be the local operating system. It can be the application. In most cases, though, it will be a remote challenger. A remote challenger is a challenger that requests state via the internet, digital content servers, secure time servers and information authorization service. Looking, um, looking at, at reporting to remote entities, the remote challenger, which could be any of the above entities, can determine that the platform is in an approved state, the owner of the machine does not have privileged access to the CPU, um, the operating system and application software are fully licensed to that machine um, with uh, maintenance fees paid, the operating system and applications are completely, utterly unpatched and modified because otherwise they have the hash written checkout. And of course, only approved applications are loaded if, if, that's, uh, if that is of interest to the, to the application vendor or content provider. What features does TCP enable? It enables, first and foremost, to secure an ongoing revenue stream. TCPA makes it trivial to enforce annual licensing fees. It allows you to stifle competition. Um, which we've um, which we've which we've discussed. What else does it allow you to do? It allows you to defeat the GPL. It allows the vendors to enable in, 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 the vendors in, and uh, the courts and intelligence to enable information invalidation. It facilitates intelligence collection, and of course, it meets the needs of needs of law enforcement and many, many more. We've talked about the first two. Let's talk about the next one. Let's talk about how does the TCP allow an application vendor to defeat the GPL. Um, HP and IBM are developing a TCP compliant version of Linux. Now, a question that has been raised by Ross Anderson, a researcher of, um, of UC Cambridge, um, of, of uh, Cambridge University in the UK, was how do they plan on making money of this? After all, the GPL requires that their result is, is, is covered by the GPL is just as much open source code. They have to, give, have to give it away for free. The evaluation process, an E3 evaluation process for an operating system um, requires literally stacks of documents this high. It's, uh, it's, it, is, it is a bureaucratic nightmare. It requires many months. And if you get away with, with, with $500,000 for the process, you get away cheaply. So, so how do they make money of it? It's simple. Yes, they will not, neither IBM nor HP nor anybody else going through the process will deny that the result is covered by the GPL. They fully will admit it. You will be able to download the source code. You will be able to download it. You will be able to compile it. You will be able to patch it. You can do absolutely anything except run it in trusted mode. Um, your operating system will do anything. It just won't run as in supervisor mode, um, which sort of does away with some of the utility of that operating system. Why will it not run in supervisor mode? It won't run in supervisor mode because you don't have the right certificate. You will need a motherboard-specific certificate in order for the uh, for that operating system to access privileged mode on the new motherboards. Well, you don't have that certificate. Um, 
even if even if HP and and, um, and and IBM were to publish their own certificate, it only works on their motherboard. It doesn't do you any good. So there were some suggested fixes to the GPL. I'll go over a couple of them. The first one is to require software authors to provide whichever services are necessary to enable an application to operate as, as the user desires. First and foremost, it, it would kill the GPL. It, it violates Richard Stallman's free speech versus free beer principle because it would require the application vendor to create a certificate for each user. They may not be even be able to do that. At any rate, they would have to provide a service to each user. Um, I say the user sends them a key, they would have to send them back a cert. That's no longer, in, that's no longer permitting free speech, that's providing free beer. Um, furthermore, they, the application vendors can't just provide you with a master key because the TPM, of course, does not just, it does not just secure HP or IBM's version of Linux, it also, it also secures Snow White. If, they, if IBM and HP were to provide you with a master key, chances are you would be able to decrypt other digital rights management encrypted software and thus, um, and thus uh, it, that would be a violation of the DMCA. Lastly, in many cases you will have third party vendors such as VeriSign sign these certificates. You can't conceivably uh, mandate that, um, that a third party vendor provide a service that isn't even part of our contract. Um, what did uh, Richard Stallman have to say about this? I talked with him about it. His reply was, treacherous computing is a major threat to our freedom. I, I think I would agree. And it is treacherous computing. Let's look at information and validation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, applications will be able to query document revocation list servers for the latest document revocation lists. Not all applications will implement that. So far there, isn't the, so far, there are no TCP enabled applications. Um, however, some application vendors have already begun at, at looking uh, at, at, at additional digital rights management, not just time-based, but also revocation-based. For example, you may wish to be able, want to be able in a company to implement mandatory access control. Only employees can access the data. But even after that, you, you as, 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 the gener as the creator of a document may wish to have the ability to at some point enforce that the document will be superseded with a new version. For that, you need to be able to recall the document that you have written but you don't know who has that copy of the word document. It could have spread anywhere. Consequently, what you need is, 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 is our servers that allow you to invalidate and revoke documents. Um, there are a number of reasons why, an why a document might be placed on a DRL. It application vendors could, though I suspect they will not because I, I believe they do not wish to take the heat for such a step. Application vendors could invalidate a document generated by a specific application. If it comes out that your application was cracked, was hacked, was stolen, um, and the application vendor finds out which of these serial numbers has been spread all over Dotella, the application vendor could revoke all documents ever generated by the application. So not only will your application stop working, but any document you've ever, ever generated with it will no longer display on anybody's computer. I don't think the application vendors will do that. I think it's too ambitious. I believe the legal ramifications are too sketchy, even for the application vendors. It could be mandated by, court, by a court order. For example, the document in question might contain uh, the horsemen of the infocalypse, instructions for uh, narcotics trafficking, child pornography, um, uh, the next version of uh, DCSS, whatever the case may be, whatever the government doesn't want you to see, whatever the vendors don't want you to see. They can, they can, uh, if they can take their case to a court and the court, the court will issue injunction that the following leaked document, the following information is, is, is not in the best interest of, um, or is against the law I should say, then your documents could be invalidated globally. Um, it could be locally illegal content. Pictures of women without veils are illegal in Muslim countries. As I mentioned, copy control ciphers are illegal or at least uh, the content providers claim are illegal to be republished uh, in, in the US as the um, uh, DCSS, DVD, CCA case showed. The, the, list, of, the list of reasons is essentially unlimited as it is for censorship. Um, it facilitates intelligence collection. Doc documents signed by user keys uh, very much, very, sim very much simplify activity correlation. Yes, you can have multiple p keys, but how many keys are you going to have? Two, three, five, ten? You won't have a hundred, and even if you had a hundred, how do you how do you keep track of a hundred keys? Um, especially not if you if it comes out, you have to pay per key because of course very sign, very sign 
ultimately will not sign your keys for free. Initially, sure, you may not have to pay, but do not believe for one moment that the service will be free in perpetuity. Uh, global unique document IDs, of course, obviously facility traffic analysis, and this preemptive inv information validation greatly simpl simplifies information flow control. If information has leaked out, say, by a disgruntled government employee who, who decides that they wish to share with the public some of the uh, shenanigans that the, that the government was up to, they can just take the document and invalidate it. Law enforcement needs. You have, the moment you have DRM, the moment you have digital signatures on documents, the moment this key is being kept in hardware and can be proven to have never left the hardware because it's a hardware security module, you have undeniable proof of authorship. Law enforcement likes undeniable proof of authorship. Courts like undeniable pr uh, proof of authorship. Opposing parties like undeniable proof of authorship. Uh, you have the document monitoring tracking I've talked about. Um, now, what happens if a document gets invalidated? Let's say there is a document that contains what um, what the what the MPA asserts is illegal uh, decryption software. Let's say that document gets invalidated. You still need to be able to access the document in court to prove that this guy, in fact, was trafficking in a mathematical equation that could be used to decrypt Snow White. Um, well, needless to say, there will be special versions for special people that um, have different rules of access control that law enforcement purpose, evidentiary purposes, that these special versions however, will never leak out in the public because just as the application, applications I mentioned earlier, they're key to a specific motherboard. They simply won't run on another motherboard. Will the TCP meet governmental requirements? Let's ask Microsoft. Mari Huarez, the Microsoft uh, P uh, Palladium, which is their TCP variant product manager, said, uh, we're talking to the government because uh, there are governments in the world and not just the US governments, all of which needs need to be met for, for a global initiative such as this to actually take off. Uh, let's look, quickly look at Fritz Holling's bill. It was mentioned briefly earlier. Fritz Holling's bill's objective is to plug the analog hole. Uh, Fritz is, is a senator in, 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 in the U.S. Senate with 2048-bit RSA. What does this mean? Encrypt monitor out, encrypt video out, encrypt audio out. Do not give the user an ability to get at the clear text, the raw analog data coming out of, an, um, out of a mini DIN uh, jack. In Microsoft's case, they also plan to uh, additionally encrypt the keyboard. This bill would make it illegal in the United States, if passed, would make it illegal in the United States to, not, uh, to sell in the future sell motherboards that are not, that are not equipped with TCPA compliant computers. Earlier you may have thought, this is just insane, nobody will buy this stuff. You won't be given a choice. You will buy it, or what else could happen? Let's take another quiz. What is the penalty a person selling a non-TCP-approved computer will face under the Hollings bill? Question, answer A, a fix-it ticket. Anybody here believe it's going to be a fix-it ticket? All right, we have a few. You guys, they, they lay off these drugs. I know it's DEF CON, but still. Um, uh, we have six months in jail. Who thinks it's six months in jail? Nobody. And then answer C, a $500,000 fine and five years in prison for the first computer you're selling that doesn't comply to the TCPA. Double that for each subsequent offense. All right, all right, we're making progress here. That's correct. The correct answer is C, $500,000 fine and five years in prison for the first computer you're selling and potentially 10 years and a million dollars for each subsequent computer you're selling. Uh, but Palladium will be uh, released as open source. <laughs> we have good news. Microsoft announced that Palladium source code will be published. Um, their VP, group VP for Windows says, we're trying to be transparent in all of this. Uh -huh. um, some take this as proof that Microsoft has changed its business practices. Now there's re continue to remain skeptical. Yet on to another quiz. Why is Microsoft releasing their source code? That just seems out of character, some would think. Um, here are the answers. Qu answer A, Microsoft intends to place Microsoft Office under the GPL in 2003. Mm. Answer B, <laughs> Microsoft will release the Windows source code under the BSD license in 2004. All right, all right, yeah, BSD, go BSD. Um, I'm a big free BSD in my fan myself, so. Um, Answer C, Microsoft has little choice but release Palladium as open source because the Hollings bill requires it. 
Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Answer C, S28 requires that, and I quote, the security system standards sell, shall ensure that any software proportion of such standards is based on open source code. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll have to wait for the G4, for the for uh, NT under under the GPL a little longer. Use of KPMs is voluntary. You'll hear that all over the place. One thing that Stuart Orkin, security officer from Microsoft, will guarantee is Palladium will be off by default. Absolutely true. You don't need to run it. You don't need to boot your computer. Um, Using gasoline, using gasoline in a car is an opt-in technology. What I found here is a, is, is, a, is a rare piece of history. It's a wood gas carburetor. Um, after Germany in World War II had been cut off from its oil reserves, they, they mounted these wood, these, basically it's like a big oven, big stove that's, that gets fired from below. You put wood in it. it, it if heated dry, it generates flammable gas that you can then feed into your carb. It, you don't get much performance out of the carb, but it will move the car forward. If, if that's all the functionality you want out of your computer, it's absolutely correct. You will not need to use Palladium. It's totally voluntary. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Um, now, wouldn't, some people say, lucky you're an alarmist. This will, no, nobody would ever do such an evil thing. No operating system vendor would ever dare to block undesirable applications from running on a computer. Well, let's ask Microsoft. Um, Microsoft let's quote Microsoft's Windows Media Player's end user licensing agreement. Microsoft may provide security-related updates to the operating system components that will be automatically downloaded onto your computer. These security-related updates may disable your ability to copy and or play secure content and use other software on your computer. It's in, it's in the end user licensing agreement right now. So would they disable, would they disable applications running on your computer? When, once they can, I think some might say they will. Microsoft says they will. Let's take a quick look at the digital holes in phase one. The opcodes are in plain text on the bus, meaning you can mark probe them off. Uh, so the solution is, is, is bleeding obvious. In phase two, the encrypted CPU instruction sets will not be decrypted until they hit the CPU. Um, in which now you get to decap, uh, now you get to decap a P5. You get to work down your layers. It's it gets nasty. It gets hideously expensive. Um, users can select non-TCP-approved operating system for minimum functionality. Obvious solution: prevent the non-approved OS from accessing CPU supervisor mode. Um, Jeffrey Strongy with AMD said, who is very much in on this. There will be a new. There will be new modes and new instructions. A whole new class of, of microprocessors, not differentiated by speed, but by security. They're adding a mode to the CPU. Um, this new hardware architecture involves some some changes to CPUs, which are significant from a functional perspective. Said Mario Yaris, who was with Microsoft, whom we quoted earlier. Yes, it will be significant from a functional perspective. If you don't have one of the certificates, you will have no functionality. Uh, well, you can always run you know, real, t um, um, real mode. Nothing will prevent you from running the CPU in real mode. You're certainly welcome to do that. Uh, the TCP may not succeed. In fact, it, in fact, I believe it will not succeed because there are people like uh, Lars Ross Anderson's writing facts and people like me giving talks. But um, it, it might succeed. If it will succeed, um, it, process ID, let's take a look at that. Big strategic mistake, Intel went alone, AMD saw an easy PR victory, publicly rejected it. Uh, there was another reason, it wouldn't actually have done what they wanted to do. TCP and my process ID just wasn't aggressive enough. Um, and the online privacy groups were completely ignored. The, uh, Intel thought they could just steamroll over everybody. It blew up in their faces. They've learned, now that they're coming around for round two, they are, um, they are a bit more savvy. They've learned the lessons. They've built a broad consensus. Intel, AMD, Motorola, all the BIOS vendors that have ever mattered, uh, the system vendors and the application vendors that matter are all on board. Um, that makes it a lot easier to pull things off. Um, there's a two-pronged um, technical and legal initiatives. As I mentioned, the TCPA, Palladium, etc. is on one side. Senator Hollings and his bills are on the other side. There's, in fact, there's a companion bill in the House. And the online privacy group, uh, groups, at least according to the TCPA, was, were briefed early. Which platforms will be enabled by TCP? I took this from their website, the, the, the banner that it is. If you look at the image, you will see laptops, servers, PDAs, and mobile phones. Mobile phones are actually the next big thing for the TCPA, uh, which is what, uh, why, why Motorola is involved so actively. Um, in future versions, 
uh, games, digital content, streaming MP3, all this stuff will be streamed down to the device uh, uh, under 3G. Um, they don't want the user to be able to copy their music off the handheld device, to copy the games off the handheld device, hence we need TCP on, on, on their mobile. What will be the end result? According to John Manfredelli, the general manager for the Microsoft Palladium Business Unit, the end result is a system with security similar to a closed architecture system, but with the flexibility of the open Windows platform. <laughs> I, I read this and I was wondering, what is he trying to say? And I think what he's trying to say is that you will have about as much control over your PC, be that operating system, be that applications, be that content, as if you were running on a timeshare system from behind a dumb terminal. But they will make you maintain the system, buy all the equipment, um, so pay for the equipment, pay for all the maintenance, without them actually being required to provide all the infrastructure that a timeshare system would. In, in some sense, Palladium and the TCP are the offline version of .NET. All the security benefits for not allowing the user access to their own applications and their own platforms without any of the costs. At this time, I would like, and I'm sorry, it's, I, I try to run through this as quickly as possible, but we're low on time here. Um, I'm, I'm willing to take any question you have, um, or at least try to take any question you have. If you email me, I'm not reading email during DEF CON. I know it's a hacker con, but folks, there are better things to do. Um, at DEF CON, I'll, I'll answer later or talk to me during the con. Find me somewhere. There's some questions. I see one right here. Yes, sir. Quick, come up. I can't hear you. Oh, uh, what are they going to do against the terrorists smashing the key servers? Um, I think uh, I think the belief is that the key servers will be replicated. The, the, the system that the key servers will be replicated that the um, that the network is sufficiently rigid at this point in time to not be uh, to not be subjected to terrorist attack. I mean, what what are they doing currently for you being not being able to install Microsoft Office unless you co you contact back to Microsoft? The answer is uh, during 911, people couldn't install an um, Office, but uh, terrorists, whether or not you can use your software, is never concerned to Microsoft's business model. Um, there was somebody on the left. Yes. Come up a little bit if you have a question. I can't hear you if you're further back. Uh, what happens if the root key becomes compromised? I don't know because I don't even know who holds the root key. Um, presumably the same thing that would happen if, if, uh, if a major CA root key becomes compromised. The odds of that happening are extremely low. If you look at VeriSign's bunkers, if you look at some of the other major commercial CAs, the security measurements they put in place, it, the, the, chan the chance of compromise is low. I don't know what the strategy is. Yes, sir. Um, what is Apple Computer? A Apple Computer is watching. Apple Computer is not, to my knowledge, uh, on board, but Motorola is. And um, it, when, when Microsoft decides someday that Microsoft Office requires uh, requires these features in the CPU or it will not display documents generated on the Windows platform, which they intend to, um, and. Microsoft will simply go to Apple and says, Apple, you have two very simple choices. You can implement DRM by using Motorola's CPUs with DRM capabilities built in, or we will no longer release Office on the Mac OS X platform. I don't think Apple can afford that. Come up if you have any questions. I can't hear you if you're more than a few lines. L L um, rolls down. Yes. Um, that, that, of course, is a question only to be left for the courts during litigation after the, after the laws have been built. My understanding is, certainly from reading the Hollings Bill, and I'm not an attorney, I'll defer this to some of the attorneys in the audience, um, that the Hollings Bill is by no means just limited to general purpose uh, computers such as uh, motherboards, but essentially covers any and all digital devices that the content holders feel uh, may infringe on their copyright. Yes, Seth, you were next.
Yes, I should mention that my apologies. This, uh, uh, the Hollings bill does not mention TCPA by name anywhere. In fact, it makes absolutely no reference to any technology, um, any specific technology by name. It just happens to describe if a capability um, that would need to be implemented that, as it so happens, simultaneously has become available out of the marketplace. What a marvelous coincidence. I beg your pardon? How can you fight this? Uh, you can fight this by speaking up. Uh, you can fight this by educating people about some of the negative. You, you will hear a lot about the positive consequences of, of TCP and Palladium. You will hear how it will protect your computer from viruses and weathers and worms and, and all, this other, uh, all these other promises. At that time, I think it's helpful to point out what some of the um, potential negative, negative consequences or perhaps we can come up with a solution that will give us all of the, or at least much of the, uh, of, the, of the positive without enabling all these negatives. Because nobody is standing up there, certainly as far as the vendors are concerned, oh, we plan on revoking your documents. Now, I do have to read through the lines as to what's going on. So, uh, point it out, yes. Um, my slides, uh, there is a version on the CD that uh, is, is, is a couple of weeks out of date. Uh, the slides will show up on Cypherpunk's Tonga. Uh, as soon as I've had a chance to upload them, I had, unfortunately had a hardware failure a few days ago that I'm still recovering from. Um, but it will be on Cypherpunk's Tonga, if not today, if not tomorrow, then certainly by next week. Yes? Epic and EFF, where, where are they in terms of lobbying the U.S. Mm -hmm. government? Um, I, I don't presume to speak for the EFF or, or EPIC, but to my, it's my understanding that uh, they're currently um, investigating uh, Palladium and, and TCPA um, to determine what their position should be. Yes? Uh, from an anti antitrust, and again, I'm not an attorney, antitrust typically um, only applies if you have some... Uh, if, if it, it, it's, it's typically only successful if you don't have a broad ability by the application vendors to join. Anybody can join the TCPA. Um, um, you can, if, if you're a legitimate application vendor, you can get the application signed. And the DMCA specifically says that you should not be able to read somebody else's digital rights management wrapped file formats. Um, which, in, which I believe, but again, I'm not an attorney, uh, ex essentially explicitly ex exempts it from, uh, from, from antitrust. Let's take somebody from over there. Yes, yes, ma'am. Oh, um, uh, yes, I probably should point this out. The new mode that will be added will be, it will be, it will effectively do, uh, play the role of what today is done by ring zero, but it will really be a ring minus one. So your existing ring zero, in ring zero code will run in ring zero being none the wiser, thinking it's in ring zero. However, above it is a ring minus one that determines which memory space the, your ring zero code then can sub-allocate it to your ring uh, one, two, and three code. So, it's, so from a compatibility reason uh, perspective, you will still be able to run all the existing operating system and systems and all the existing applications. It's just they will not be able to get any of the protected storage or any of the other information that's protected by the TPM. From your OS perspective, what's happening and above it is totally transparent. Yes. Oh, Sony is a special case. Um, Sony is, is Sony, of course, is both. Uh, Microsoft is some say is somewhat of a small content provider. They have Microsoft, NBC, and a few, but they're, they're not so much in the content game. Sony is both heavily in the content and heavily in the in the computer game. Um, what if you if you look at the membership lists of the various groups fighting for? fighting for legal protection of their, of, of, of their copyrighted work by means of draconian technical means, uh, you will find that there's very little overlap. Um, it appears that the, that the vendors made a decision to, choice, to choose one of the fora to fight in, be that either the content provider fora or the technologists fora. Sony is very heavily involved in the content technology list, content technology for us, not so much in the, um, the content for us, not so much in the technology for us. It appears they've, they've chosen to, to fight the fight in the content technology for us, in the content for us rather than the technology for us. Sorry for the long-winded answer. Yes? Yes? Mm -hmm. Um, again, that's, that's a question for your attorney only after the, after the laws have been, have been passed by Congress and signed by, signed by the President. Um, and even then, the question probably can't be answered until there's been some case law. I, we, I'm running over time here. Um, I'll take one more question after yours. Um, the, 
Um, the answer is, it's, I don't know if this is the answer. I, I choose to believe that it's not a digitalized management, that digitalized management, the requirement does not come into play unless there's actually some digital rights management that can take place. So, so uh, for, say, if you, if, you, if you have a new file format in which none of the content providers publish their digitally right managed content, then you're probably okay. Um, if, if, you have a, if you have a general purpose computing platform, things might get dicey. One more question. Um, the other question, as I said, find me at the con, send me some email. Let's take some in the back, but you have to step up because I will not be able to hear from where you stand. Um, that's an excellent question. The question was, um, most of the average users couldn't care less as to whether they can compile their own operating systems or, or, or their own applications. Um, in fact, most average users probably would be would happily entrust the security of, of their computer to the FBI and, home, and the Office of Homeland Security um, readily. And many average users actually probably would, would, would support a mandate for the Office of Homeland Security to remotely administer computers for security. Um, how, do you, um, how do you address it? By... by Users like content. Um, yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a good example. Users like content. Um, um, even even non-hackers, non-sophisticated computer users have been bitten at one point by the Napster bug. Napster did marvels. Um, it did a marvelous job in in bringing out in bringing to the user the, the the promise of getting content for free with a user interface they could use. And having thus become addicted, I believe one can perhaps educate them that um, that the supply is about to be cut off. All right. Thanks for your time. I don't want to take too much time of the next speaker.